Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Big Jiu-Jitsu Show, member of the Pod Bros Podcast Network. Don't forget to go to podbros.com and find yourself another podcast you want to listen to. And check out our sponsor, Strap and Roll Soap Company. Use promo code BEEFSQUATCH to get some money off your order, especially for that scrub akami for mommy or your uh, or the Jiu-Jitsu shirt. We just got some more back in stock. And our other sponsors, Rolls Gear as well as Tape Armor. And find all of our old episodes at bjjshow.com. I'm Rob, and I just got finished recording an episode with the guys from the BJJ Campaign podcast. And if you haven't heard of them, they're another North Carolina-based podcast. And we had a really good conversation that may or may not have had a a special guest just jump in. James Clearman, actually, a third-degree black belt out of Indiana. So it was a uh, co-stream podcast. We had James Clearman as well, so a lot of topics got covered and uh, had a great time. So I really hope you guys enjoy this episode. And uh, like I said, don't forget to find all of our old stuff at bjjshow.com. Like and subscribe to us on iTunes. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Welcome to episode 48 of the BJJ Campaign Podcast. My name is Jeff Boone. I'm an A3, blue belt, two stripes. Phil Kors, A2, blue belt, one stripe. Rob Austin, A4, brown belt, no stripes. And Rob is co-streaming with us today. He's yeah. got the big jujitsu podcast. Rob, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. And uh, where are we today, Rob? We are currently in the radio room of Camp Laurel, I think it is, uh, the Origin Immersion Camp, day two? Day, day two? Day one was a blur. Yeah, day one day was two. a blur. Yeah, day, we're day two. Day two. Day one goes by so fast. It really does. Love it. just getting started. Maybe our favorite place on earth. It's the best week of the year. It's, hey man, I'm hooked with it. Man. You get it. How many do, times have you been here now? This is actually, let's not worry about that right now. There's No, it's actually my <laughs> second time here. So like last year was my first year, but I've known, yeah. a, I've known a lot of the guys that are here for a long while because um, I finally like bit the bullet, came to last year's camp. I was supposed to go the year before, but I was in Germany uh, with the military. I was in the army and... When there was supposed to be a camp, I was in Africa for uh, doing some work there. And I was like, well, not this year. And then James Hoffman, the guy who owns Trapping Rural Soap Company, for a full year pretty much said, you're worthless. I hate you. You're scared of camp. And I kept saying, like, hey, it's not my fault, dude. But then I got through it and flew over last year from Germany and got the camp in and I'm hooked. And you're back from Germany now, right? You're living in Fayetteville. Yeah, I'm living yeah. in Fayetteville, yeah, boy, man. Back to the USA. Um, I'm ha- I miss Germany, but you know it's home. I'm originally from Fuquay, and mm-hmm. uh, it's, a- it's actually kind of nice to be able to talk about this on the podcast because you know we're both like North Carolina based podcasts, so I can say Fuquay and not like the Raleigh area. It's like south of Raleigh, like 30 yeah. minutes. Yeah, uh, shell shock BJJ. That's what I associate with uh, Fuquay, yeah, Marina. Exactly. So yeah, I grew up uh, near Wake Tech. Or not grew up. I, I spent some time in Apex. I'm originally born in Apex, but I call Fuquay my home because that's where I, you know, grew up the most mm-hmm. in there. Uh-huh. So, and you originally started training way back when with Team Rock in Fayetteville, yeah. correct? Uh, it was actually Andrew. Um, Team Rock did have a school in Fayetteville. I trained under Brian Mangy and Neil Weaver uh-huh. at the original TFTC location in Andrew, which is one city over from okay. uh, from Fuquay. And that was back in 2004, 2005. Wow. Long time. Yeah. Seen a lot of changes in jujitsu. Let's talk about that. <laughs> All right. Well, like, uh, you know, we got to give the well, the warning. I did take a break between like 2006 up to like uh, about 2009, 2010. Yeah, no. So, I, I mean, but but there's big differences in what jujitsu looks like today and what it looked like in 2004, 2005. Right? Really? Yeah. A ton of it. Like, I mean, let's talk about that because I'm, I'm always very interested in that game because even just being in it for two and a half years, I see stuff come around now that two and a half years ago is like, oh, that's bullshit. Yeah, you know, we're, we're not gonna, we're not doing that, and it's coming around again. It's like, oh, this is really cyclical. So, what's what's some of the differences you've experienced? Say, say way back when, you know, maybe maybe uh, one of the things that that is now becoming popular today is that 
arm over the arm and gripping the lapel that they call it an old school grip, but it's kind of coming back in competition today. Yeah. Whereas you didn't see that for the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, the thing that I always talk about is like the basics will always be there. The basics always show like will show up and, and they work, you know, Hodger Gracie's proved that like, you know, there's so many guys who do come back and they, they show the basics are what like work throughout time. When when I started, um, my coach Brian he did show some leg locks, so like a, sure. a, a straight angle lock, a knee bar. And I was uh-huh. brand new, no gi, white belt. Like uh, I had to borrow a gi to do a tournament because I'd never worn a gi before <laughs> for uh, <laughs> for the tournament. That's hilarious. Yeah, it was like it, it was a it was a Pendergrass tournament. It was in Raleigh. I remember it. And uh, the special guest that year was Matt Sarah, and this is right after he'd finished filming uh, the Ultimate Fighter season four. And wait, was, was did he beat St. Pierre at that time or was that before? That was, that was legitimately right before right he, before the, he fought him. No kid. Yeah. So, oh, wow. so he, uh, we, we did come in with the, uh, I asked him, I was like, Hey, uh, is Mark Lehman that big of a jerk in real life or wait, how, how bad of language can I use on the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Every, every language. Everything. I was yeah. like, hey, is he, is he as big of an asshole in real life as he is like on TV? And He's like, oh yeah, that dude's a fucking douchebag. Like, he, was, he, was, he was very animated about it. So yeah, that was right before the uh, the St. Pierre fight and um, the surprise knockout that he got for that. Um, so that was the big thing. You know, Matt Sarah was there and I'd never done uh, like a gi tournament. So my coach Brian let me borrow his gi. And uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. It went well. I got second. I was excited about nice. it. And um, I actually, believe it or not, won my first match with a straight angle lock. And was that legal in white belts? Yes, then? absolutely. Okay, because it's not legal in white belt today. It is. Uh, certain, straight cer- angle lock? Cer- yeah. Certain tournaments, yeah. What is? Yeah. Oh, I thought straight yeah. ankle locks. Yeah. Was, so, okay. but the thing is, too, you couldn't you couldn't do any um any reaping of the leg either inside or outside. Sure. So you pretty much. Um, I had foot on the hip, foot on the inside of the thigh, and I did my straight angle lock. Yeah. So, because I, I remember that, like, looking over at Brian, I'm like, this is good. Is it okay <laughs> if I do this? Because I was just dumb white belt at that time. No stripe white belt. Just, and then, no uh, stripe, no gi white belt. No stripe, no gi white belt. And then, you know, I will admit, that, like, the, the finals, I tapped to a smother. Because... Uh, <laughs> First tournament, folks. You heard yeah, it here. Man, it's yeah. Uh, it's real it's, deal. It's not as graceful, I guess, as everybody thinks it is. You know, everybody like gets the cool podium pictures. Yeah. And I remember driving home. I was like, I tapped out to a fucking dude laying his <laughs> his chest in my face. Was it like that Will Smith? Did he have a bare chest so that you were getting that full his full? Oh yeah, no manliness. Way, there was no rash guard under the gear <laughs> at this time. That, was, that wasn't no rash guards in two thousand four. No, it was it was um it was it was kind of interesting like how you trick so. I had basketball shorts. I'd wear like undershirts and stuff. Like there wasn't much like for rash guards or, you know, you had sprawl shorts. You had tap out. Um, and if you're adventurous and I'm, I'm going to call him out, Trevor Burns. Oh, you, I, I started training with Trevor Burns. Trevor Burns. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, world masters champ. Yeah. He both just won. And his weight class. He's a monster, man. He is a like monster. he is, he, he's a rough dude and I'm going to call him out because I love him. I have picture like, you know, I have evidence of it, but he would wear Valley Tudor shorts, the train <laughs> Noki and, and he was, Trevor bring them Valley Tudor shorts back. I agree, baby. man. <laughs> I agree, dude. He, he looks, I thought you were going to say something like bad boy. <laughs> no, well, I don't know if they were va- bad boy or not, but I was like, hey, Trevor, you don't, don't look half bad in those, man. Like, so legit, it was pretty awesome. But yeah, that was, that was it, man. Um, I was also kind of a broke college student, so I couldn't afford the gear. So Brian really helped me out with that one. But yeah, that's that's kind of what it was with uh, I guess like leg locks. But that's that was like a limited white belt knowledge of what sure. was going on at the time. And then uh, I guess fast forward to uh, 2009, 2010 when I started back up. You know, I was kind of uh, joined the military and kind of fell back in with combatives and my, you know, I was, I was a super badass like no stripe white belt. So like in combatives terms, it was pretty good for like everybody else who hadn't done anything. So I'm like, right. I'm really good at smashing people with no experience whatsoever. And, uh, I was like, well, it's probably about time I get back into it. It'd be nice. And then I was in Virginia. I found a school out there. And oh, so, which one did you go to? I uh, was at, uh, it was originally called USA Jiu Jitsu. It was in Springfield, Virginia, which it later turned into Matt Larson Combat Fitness Center. Okay. 
like three months before I left there. Nice. Nice. And w- initially what drew you, Rob, what drew you to jiu-jitsu? What was, what was that? I mean, for me, just as, yeah. as an example, I was a wrestler and I've gotten way out of shape and, yeah. and, and I was, you know, I was listening to Jocko who's here at camp yeah. and was like, I got to get back in, into something. And I was like, this is it. Whenever I did it, I was like, holy cow, this is, this is it for me. This Were is you, good. Did you wrestle in uh, North? Are you from North Carolina? I'm from West Virginia originally. West, okay, yeah. cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I did Taekwondo for the longest time and, uh, I, we had a Muay Thai program, I guess, if you want to call it that pretty much it was a, it was a link system, which was under a uh, Jarn Chai and they're like, Oh cool. You know, Muay Thai and I could do like a jab cross hook. And then, you know, when I started training with TFTC, I realized my jab cross hook was not as good as I actually thought it was. And a lot of, a lot of harder lessons and like how not to be terrible <laughs> at Muay Thai. I'm still not good at it, but, uh, I, uh, my friend Brian Potter, I met through the Muay Thai school or the Muay Thai program because there wasn't much in the area of Fuqua at that time. It was either you did Taekwondo at the school I was at, or you did Taekwondo at the other school on the other side of the city, Mm -hmm. or you drove into like Raleigh, which for a like 17 year old, 18 year old kid was, it's like a 45 minute drive for me to go train at like, but Forge Fitness is now. Billy, yeah. Yeah, Billy's place. Um, but it wasn't even on my radar. So I was like, uh, you know, I'll do some Muay Thai Potter was like, Hey, we're going to watch pride. I'm like, what's that? He's like, Oh, it's a, it's a MMA. People can stomp each other on the head, stuff like that. So <laughs> then when I saw like, you know, the, the Gracie's and Sakuraba and they're doing all sorts of like, you know, submissions and just beating the tar out of each other. I was like, that's cool. I, w- I, w- I wish I knew where I could learn that. Yeah. And believe it or not, Brian Mingy actually came to one of the classes and like choked me out. I'm like, okay, you're opening a school. I'll be there. So kind of not really completely departed my Taekwondo roots, but definitely skewed more towards uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu from that. And I just wanted to learn how to choke people out and break arms. And that was just kind of like, what's a, what's a early twenties guy want to do, you know, at that time, I got something proven, you know, I was a really tough kid before that. And now I can, now I can do it, man. It's, it's martial arts. It's cool. It's, you you see the guys and you're like, oh man, look at that dude. He's like, uh, you look up to Hoist Gracie and stuff. Like this guy's just beating, beating the snot out of people doing just jujitsu. And I'm like, I, I want to do something like that. I want to be able to like be seen as like, Hey, you know, like I can handle himself, but then it just turn into me loving it. Right. And mm-hmm. just doing it. Like all the, all the original reasons are like out the door for that. Isn't that funny how yeah. that always changed? I mean, it changes from for me from year to year because I wanted to do it to get in shape. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's all I really wanted to do it for. And then I just fell in love with the art itself, and and you know started competing and and doing other stuff. Um, oh yeah. I, <laughs> why don't you talk a little, Phil? I mean, you, we're over here. You're talking. still over there dicking around. Come nah, on, soon, beating on the table. <laughs> but. Uh, it, it does, it's changes and, and jujitsu changes with you. And what I love seeing is every year we come back here and Alexi's first seminar last night, like, I don't know if it's every year, but last year and this year it was on breaking guard. Yeah. I love that, man. It, I, it's a, it's, it still fascinates me that the fundamental concepts are the concepts that that you have to perfect over a lifetime. Yeah, and it um the breakout session after that with the, at least for the brown belts and the black belts, we just expanded upon that. Like, okay, so what comes next? What are we going to do from there? So now it gives us options, right? And that's something that I feel the is kind of the cool part of jiu-jitsu because I want to learn about all the weird branches like you can go out there and do this. Like today um Today we did a uh, pass under from De La Hiva, uh, De La Hiva guard that Dedeco taught. And then Alexi came up to me and uh, Roger, and he grabbed my, my sleeve. He said, let me show you something. And he dug his hand into my forehead. It was painful. It I've hurts. Never, yeah, he did yeah. that to us yesterday. I've yeah. never seen that. And that's crazy because now it's like, because usually he was like, Yo, well, you do that to break grips. It makes breaking grips easier. Because I was always like, somebody grabs your collar, you put both hands on top of it, and you push down, you stand straight up. So you're not like, you know, giving them like a, a give 
when you're trying to pull the hand off. So it's a game changer. Now I don't have to use two hands. You got one hand if you just reach it up a bit and you like you pressure into the forearm and, and it goes down. With like this grip. Yeah, 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 exactly that James one. James did that to me yesterday and I, I told him. I was, <laughs> I was like, uh, James Klingerman, I was like, um, it felt different when he did it. So I think you might be doing something wrong. So. <laughs> like, yeah, he's good at jujitsu and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for you guys, yeah, so, so the thing is too, since we're co-streaming it, I can't be the one answering all the questions. So I want to know, like, sure. when you guys... You guys both train at the same school, right? Yes. We do under John Plowler and okay. Fight to Win Denver. That's what I was going to ask, where you guys train at. Mm -hmm. So when do you guys, because I know we had talked a little bit about it on, a, when you uh, hit me up, you're like, you're back in North Carolina? I was like, yeah, I'm back in North <laughs> Carolina. Um, and you said like uh, a lot of people helped you or inspired you to start, start this podcast. And I find it interesting because I was a blue belt as well when I started my podcast. Were you really? Yeah. So okay. it was me and Sean Kyle. Sean was a white belt. I was a blue belt. And we kind of joked. I was like... Who the fuck wants to hear the opinions of a jiu-jitsu guy, yes. a blue belt guy and a white belt guy? He's like, ah, who cares? We're going to talk about Steven Seagal in one of the episodes. And, and that's what we try to do. Um, what what drew you guys to starting your own podcast and kind of wanting wanting to be a voice in the uh, not just the, I guess, worldwide Brazilian jiu-jitsu community, but like even North Carolina? Yeah. Uh, we hung out a lot and all we did was talk about jiu-jitsu. <laughs> so it's pretty easy uh i think we've gotten a lot better um over the year or so that we've been doing it at you know how it the interviews happen yeah. and like what we're trying to talk about and keeping it so everybody kind of can enjoy it you know but we definitely had that same thing and we don't ever talk about like a technique or anything like that he's terrifying he's a very james clinger oh, staring <laughs> at, at the door <laughs> Come on in, James. We're doing a podcast yeah. now. Uh, we were just talking about him, folks. Uh, this was James Klingerman, who we were just talking about with his uh, magical grips and digging into the arm. He's he's popped in for a little bit. Come on around, James. Get on the mic. Uh, we're we're doing a co-stream uh, <laughs> with with Rob Austin here and Big Jiu Jitsu, and of course the BJJ Campaign Podcast. Uh, James, sit in Phil's seat because he doesn't um, talk that much. This is anyway. pretty awesome, man. Like this is like the most impromptu. <laughs> You guessed ever. I like it. So. Well, hi, guys. <laughs> Indiana Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, come a little closer to the mic. There you go. Good. That's a boy. I don't want to sound like Phil. <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> I know he does really talk quietly. We're on our way to the pro shop. So, yes. So Going to buy some more gear. Probably. Yeah, that's what happens here. Yeah. Uh, James Klingerman, a professor at Indiana Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He just got uh, back from Worlds. Coaching his team there and competing. Yep. Yes. Right? Sweet. And uh, a veteran of this. Last year, he was one of the instructors here at the um, at the Origin Immersion Jiu-Jitsu Camp. We learned a lot from him. Loop chokes. We learned all kinds of other stuff. And he and and his wife, AJ, uh, are who um, we made adopt, Phil and I, for um, to be our jiu-jitsu parents. So... That's uh, <laughs> that. Even though I'm older than both of them, <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't old matter. matter right? man. <laughs> it's just they're better at jujitsu than Who's both counting, of us. Right? So, <laughs> so, so, James, um, what brought you back this year? What? What? what oh, jeez. Yeah. See, I need, I need like an email so I can pr prep no, these no, answers. No, no. This is all. This uh, is all. No, off man. The cuff. I had I had a great time last year. Um, yeah, it's fun. It's awesome. It's it's a uh, it's a little getaway, and it's cool because you can train jujitsu with some amazing people. Uh, you know, three, four, five times a day, or you can just chill and go go canoeing. One of my guys got up at like five this morning and went out on the on the lake. And That's crazy because it was really freaking cold yeah, this morning. Right. I, he's, he was bored. So, um, but yeah, man, it's just it's it's awesome. I, I I enjoy the walk to and from. Like it's just out kind of being in nature, walking around and. Yeah, getting to get to meet everybody and it's a good time. It's fun. It's beautiful here. Oh yeah. And I'm gonna put you on the spot right now. Okay. And I'm gonna say what what either technique or techniques or concepts are you looking at while you're here? And possibly this may mean that it's a specific um teacher that you wanna learn these things from, but Whenever you train with purpose or come to a camp like this, because, you know, Phil and I on the last episode, we kind of identified our goals for, yeah. for what the camp is. Because if you don't train with purpose, then you're kind of wasting a little bit of the training, yeah, right? Absolutely. Is there anything that comes to mind for you? I mean, high level black belt, thir fourth? Third. Third degree black belt. Um, 
that you wanted to explore when you're here? I'm not saying learn, but explore more. Yeah, not, not nothing specific, right? But so perfect example. Uh, today's session, uh, the deco showed some, some lapel guard stuff, right? Mm. And it works right along with, um, my, my leche guard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a, a different scenario, but, but similar, similar gi tie ups. And he hit this little back take mm -hmm. from, from the guys doing a back step. And so he, he, he showed three moves. One was the back take, but he kind of glossed over it. He's like, Oh, you can also do this. <laughs> and I was like, well, crap, I already do those other two moves. So after, after the session, you know, cause then, uh, uh, like say Todd, Hoffa taught. So we got a lot of info, that, but I went back to the deco and I was like, Hey, will you please redo that back take for me? Let me video that because I, you know, I was like, I was using that from, from coyote guard. And he's like, I don't know what coyote guard is. And I was like, what's well, Lucas Leche guard. But he's like, okay. I was like, he calls a coyote guard. Right. But, uh, so, you know, anytime I'm training anywhere and not necessarily just this camp, but I, I look for something that mimics or is kind of in the same realm as something that I'm already good at already playing that I can just expand on it. And he was like, oh yeah, the grip, because we did a high grip and we did a low grip. Well, the back take was a mid grip. And so during the training session, we actually didn't discuss the mid grip at all. Like I said, he glossed over it, but I was like, that's, that's what I was interested in is that extra little bit there. And so I pulled him to the side, I videoed it, I made him do it on me and I'm like, cool. Now I have an amazing back take that fits with a game that I'm already fairly decent at, but it just, one little move like that can make a huge difference and, and make the whole trip worth it to me. Right. Isn't that awesome? And you got that all on your second day. Yeah. That's awesome. Who knows what else is going to happen right. while we're out here? I'm sure, there's some surprises. I, I think I know who the special guest is. I think so too. So, who do you think it is? Because are we supposed to say? Huh? I don't know. I mean, this will come out later. So no, it, this is at, know. on the big jujitsu show. It's dropping today, so P will probably come stab me in the face if yeah. If, yeah. I, let's just say this. I'll I'll give the hint of who I think it is. It's one of the professors here. Professors. Yeah, that's my no. guess. Yes. No. Yes, Rob. Can't be. It yes. can't be. Shut your mouth. It is. <laughs> he already surprised me at Mike Swain. I was like, oh my. Yeah, I had no idea. Mike Swain showed up last that, night. I was, I was like, like, oh my God, dude. And then and then they trained today. Mike Swain taught. And I was like, well, I wouldn't. No offense to the guy, yeah, I know. And, and no, no offense to you know the guys I did train with, who I you know, like I said, I picked up that that fantastic move from the deco. I was like, I, I kind of want, and I don't even like judo. I hate yeah. judo, but that was, ditto, <laughs> I want to go train with Mike. Oh, judo's good. Listen, judo's whatever. Good. I'm being 100 here. All right, Rob. All right, all right. Me and Phil hate judo. Why? It, Listen, I, will, I, I can't so argue with James and the me. I'm a brown belt in judo. I'm two time American yes. Cup champion, and I really? hate judo. I hate yeah. judo. Wow. It hurts. It hurts, and I'm not good at it. I need, I need to have you alone on this show that I don't want to talk okay. about that. And I like shooting single legs. And But I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. It was such a fun session, and I actually learned some judo this yeah. morning with Mike Swain. What I will say is. Like I said, I did judo for such a long time. I competed in judo, and I always just used jujitsu. Right. Once I learned to wrestle, so when I got my brown belt in, in jujitsu, my coach was like, "Hey, you need to learn to wrestle. Like, <laughs> like this is what this is your black belt." He's like, "Jujitsu wise, I could give you a black belt, but I want you to be like powerful. I want you to learn like heaviness and and takedowns and like start to wrestle." And so the three years I had my brown, that was a big part of my focus. Well, learning to wrestle. I was like, oh, this movement, these, you know, these grips, these setups, all this stuff is what judo was missing when I was taught judo. Right. Right. And I had fantastic judo coaches. It just, I don't know if their teaching style didn't, never resonated with me or if I just didn't, if I was too young to pick it up. Right. But once I learned to wrestle my judo, after not doing judo for 10 years, my judo got a million times better. So I, I use the grips a lot, but even now I don't do a lot of traditional throws. I do judo grips with wrestling throws. So I like it. Oh my god, that's that sounds dirty, and I like it. That is dirty. <laughs> I'll show you my my devil's handshake that I hit at Worlds. I saw match. that. I love. Oh yeah, the one that you t uh, the one that you did the tape on. Yeah. Yes. I hit it first match at Worlds. Yes. Nice. There you Very go. cool. Yeah, I definitely would like to have you. I'm already putting it out there in the cool. universe. Yeah. Show. I, I, yeah, absolutely. 
I definitely want to hear like the full big story about like the combination of just going wrestling judo and like okay. the judo competition stuff. That's yeah. wild. Sounds good. Ruby. Very good. Well, James, we will, we will. Yeah, she's like, I'm <laughs> out of here, yeah. man. There's AJ right now waving. We will let you go with AJ perfect, perfect. now. Thank you for coming in here. Absolutely. We really appreciate it. I didn't and mean of to course, hop uh, in on the podcast. Now, no, the I'm glad most, I did. The most, uh, the the guest who's been with uh, BJJ campaign, the most tied with his wife, AJ. It's James Klingerman. Thank tired. you, James. She's not here. No, but she was here on Beauty and the Geek. Oh, Gee. she was. You, you guys weren't. did that co-podcast. So now, Dang. booyah. Shout out to Beauty and the so Geek podcast. So now, what? Now you got to keep them both on there to keep the title like in the family? <laughs> we're going like, to see what's right? going on. Okay. We're, you're going to be getting emails from, hey, hey, get me on, but not every day. <laughs> She'll be like, hey, hey, I've got some real cool stories, but uh, James can't come on. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Thanks again, James. Yeah, thank you yeah, so appreciate much. It, man. Appreciate it. See you guys later. Yes. See you in a bit. That was James Klingerman, ladies and gentlemen, Indiana Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Please, if you're in the area, stop by and train with him. He's amazing. His his uh, Peruvian neckties, uh, loop chokes is, I mean, everything that he teaches. Von Flu. He's got endurance BJJ too. Also, oh yeah, that's I right. Can't fill his shoes. My stories are terrible. Yeah, they are terrible. It's not. So, gonna be you just got to be around longer, terrible. man. It's like, true. So where were we? So I think it was a good question because that was something like uh, we did talk about before we started it. And I was like, you know, to be totally honest, if another blue belt and white belt started a podcast, I probably wouldn't really care. I know know? it's kind of terrible, isn't it? But like, that's just (laughs) the reality. And like, I knew that going in and we talked about it early on, especially like we're not going over any technique. Like, yeah, that's just not going to happen. But I think we're up there with anybody and how much we love doing it and how much fun we have and how much I want other people to try it. Yeah. No, I mean the whole, I think as long as like you're talking about not taking the techniques, not teaching techniques, you take the approach of just having the enjoyment of doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, kind of your own like daily struggle. That's kind of, kind of what we try to cover in our podcast as well. It's just, we were a white belt and a blue belt who just wanted to talk about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the shenanigans that we had to deal with. Now, thankfully, like, uh, what was it two months later, we both got promoted. So it was a purple belt and a blue belt. There so that was, that was nice. So it gave us maybe a little more legitimacy at that point, but also like, um, it was cool to chronicle that like the, the, the travel from like on air going from using a microphone attached to a like electric keyboard for the phantom power <laughs> that I can use a line out and put it into my computer to record off of audacity to like now. That's great. Yeah. So, and then I think that I'm really excited for you guys. Cause you're going to be able to like document that as well. Cause I mean, like this is what one full year of podcasting. Just yeah, like almost right. we'll yeah. be, we're five weeks away from, well, four weeks now away from one full year. And I just want to go back to that whenever, whenever we're talking about whenever we started it and who inspired us, you know, honestly, whenever we left you, Jocko, all Ryan Mickler, who we just talked to. Yeah, yeah that was the, wild. Too, yeah, man. that was awesome. Order a man. He's here. He's setting up in the same. Yeah, he's got like a great podcast. He's asking us questions. I'm like, why, why are you asking me? What's what we're doing? <laughs> it's like yeah, <laughs> about our audio. Our audio just got to not suck. Um, but, but that was, that's the thing is that I, I said to Phil, man, we're sitting here, we're talking about jujitsu an hour after jujitsu. Why not chronicle this? Because this is going to give us something to look back on. And, you know, we did, uh, with the new year's episode, we look back on the entire year and what we were doing. Yeah. It's incredible what you learn in a year of jujitsu. It really is. And you, you're going to forget a lot of it too, which, which sucks too, but yeah. it shows up later. Yeah. No, no. And I already have some of it, not yeah. a lot of, it, yeah. because I don't really know it's a lot of it. Times but where something comes back and it's like, oh yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. I did it for like three weeks and then I forgot about <laughs> it completely. Yeah, no, sure and, and so so yeah, I mean, I think that's a big aspect for us is that that you know we hope listen, we hope the audience enjoys it and 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 we really try to make sure that we're topical and that they do and make sure that we're not. I mean, God knows we're not authorities on really anything other than having fun at jujitsu. Cause I don't know of anybody who has more fun than me or Phil. 
Maybe Rob Austin. Possibly. <laughs> if you're the breakout session, it was just mainly uh, mainly me avoiding Jimmy Mack and uh, Roger trying to kill me and then <laughs> Hoffa calling me big and poking me. I mean, that's that's fun. That's still fun for me. For so sure. so when, with you guys, um, one full year, right? Almost one full year doing uh, podcasting. What are some of the challenges you guys have found with like the growing pains of doing a podcast? Obviously, audio stuff yeah okay yeah, yeah. i mean i when we got started i had no concerns at all i was like it's 2018 how hard could it be every it seems like everybody has one like it can't be hard it's harder than you think it really is uh the video stuff was harder um we do like a 40 50 minute podcast so like it's frustrating when you think you have a video that worked and it didn't and you're like we can't do that again you know yeah and uh that's that's been a challenge and jen helped us a lot jen uh eads from beauty and the gee podcast yeah she spent a lot of time trying to help us equipment and stuff and and get it figured out because it matters i mean it does make a difference to people and uh the other big one is kind of making sure we have enough things to talk about you know um and we're I, the, actually, the funny thing, the one complaint I've heard the most, pretty much the only complaint, is that we're too hard on ourselves. We do make fun of ourselves because everybody, everybody who does jujitsu seems to think they suck. Yeah, so dude, BJJ is a just is full of self depreciating humor. Right, that, it really is. Like you, you talk to people, you're like, oh, how long have you been rolling? Oh, you know, I'm all right, man. It's kind of been doing it for like seven years, but you know. Kind of sucks still. Like, it's no matter what. Like, and then, but I guess it's maybe because of the ego thing. Because people are like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm a brown belt. I'm way better than both of you." Or like, "I'm pretty fucking good." Like, yeah, nobody he is I'm, way better. No, no. But <laughs> you get what I'm saying. I've never right. said that. I, no, I, no, I know. Yeah. But I was saying, like, I always told my guys, like, I'm not better than you. I just have more years on the mat. That's all. It, that's all it is. <laughs> same, same, like, like uh, move set. It just, I've done them a few more times. And it's what keeps me coming back because I'm like, you know what? I look at all these people who are doing it and I hear it all the time. I'm like, you know, my first year doing it, I was like, they're full of shit. They've got some sort of special thing. And then I'm like, I see it and I'm getting better and I can see me getting better. And then whenever new people walk in, it's like, oh man, I don't suck as bad as the new people. Hey, exactly. <laughs> as long as there's comparison. It's like, <laughs> but, but it's like, and, and then you see it and then you experience, you experience that not sucking at certain moments in time. And you're like, this is how it's all going to be at some point in time. Yeah. I've just got to keep coming and, and figure it out, you know? And that's what, that's what, you know, it inspired me by the talent code and also by, you know, our coaches, John Plyler, um, you know, he says it, just keep coming back. And, 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 you know, and it does, it breaks their heart. It breaks my heart whenever people leave us, you know, I mean, granted, I don't learn their name till they got at least one stripe on their white belt, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. That is a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, No, I agree a hundred percent. I don't, you're not even people to me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just kidding as kidding. well. We love the white belts. They keep the doors open, but, but you know, it's, People don't realize that you're optimizing yourself by doing jujitsu and not just your physical self, your entire self. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's an exercise and everybody, you know, the cliche of you're going to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, um, one of the things that I did when I was in Germany, uh, one of my students, uh, we call him big John. He's a John Mills. He's legitimately built. I always say this. He's legitimately built like the, if you saw the old comic with like the guy, the little guy on the big Jack dude. And it's like, that's it, John or whatever, Jeff, like use his weight against him. And he's just standing there. Like that is what big John is built like. And he lives up to the name big John. Like he, my favorite big John story is he did a tournament. Oh man. It was like a year ago. And this one guy had put John in a key lock. It was inside Big John's guard. And Big John was like, what are you doing, man? Reversed the key lock. Like, just def- defended it, right? With his one arm. And subbed the dude. Because the dude, like, like really... I don't know what he did. He snapped something. Or he partially tore something in his back. But he, like, screamed in the middle of the match. 
And my, my buddy was the the guy running the tournament. I looked over at him. I was like, arms up. Like, I don't know what he did. Like, and John got up. I was like, how did I do that? It just turned out he just big John his way out of it and subbed the dude somehow. But, <sighs> but like, um, where in God's name was I going with this? I don't even know. Big John. Big John. Big John story. Oh, Big John story. Yeah. I like Big John. Yeah. Big John's pretty good. What belt Dude, is that's Big terrible. John He's a uh, purple belt now. Nice. But, you know, it's, um, we're, t- oh, geez, man, this is terrible. But do you keep in touch with those guys? That you- Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, cool. it's, um, Big John's going to San Antonio right now. So, but <sighs> you're talking about like optimizing yourself. Oh, optimizing yourself. Yeah. Oh, sh- that's right. God. So he, he's very big. He's a uh, behavioral health specialist in the army mm-hmm. and they did something with resilience and he wanted to incorporate Brazilian jiu-jitsu into teaching resilience to the, the base. And that's oh, kind really? of, yeah, it was, it was really cool. So pretty much it was teaching people like kind of showing if you don't have the s- skill set mentally to deal with certain terrible situations, like, you know, the military, like, oh man, I got to deploy or hey, I got to go on TD, which is like temporary, like going somewhere and away from the family or, you know, I've got to work late and I might miss Christmas. Like, or I think my first sergeant's mad at me because I was late for PT for me, stuff like that. Right. Sure. And if you don't have the rule set or the mindset or the skill set to, to fix it or counter it, then you're just going to let that weight get on you. So I did like an example of being mounted and being choked. And if you don't know what's going on, you don't know how to reverse there, do like the UPA drill or whatever to get out of being mounted. It's the same exact thing. You got all this weight, you got all this pressure on you. And it's, and if you stay there, it's going to be detrimental to your physical health. You know how to reverse it. You know how to deal with it. Now you're okay. Just like the mental aspect of it. If you have like this weight bearing down upon you and you don't have the skill set or the know how, then it's going to be de- detrimental to your mental health, which will also in turn be detrimental to your physical health. A hundred percent. And, you know, I think that you bring up a good point there. And that is that, that I've always been someone who's always taken the direct approach. Yeah. What jujitsu has taught and taught me in life and in jujitsu is that indirect approach is sometimes the best approach. And if you know that, it, it just knowing it is is such a powerful tool that that you don't have to meet head on with everything. Yeah, and, and you know, things that that expose me to that, you know, both with the te- teachings of uh, of, of Jocko and and his books and um and just doing jujitsu. I think it's just such a valuable life lesson. And again, I don't know of anybody who's listening to these two podcasts that doesn't do jujitsu, but if you are and you're not my mother, then go out and do jujitsu. You're weird. <laughs> Andrew Smith said it best. He's like, why are you listening? I think he said on dirty white belt. He's like, why are you listening to this? Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. What are you yeah. doing, man? Andrew yeah. Smith really well, good goes at jujitsu. Back to also what you were saying earlier about your goals change year over year. It started to get in shape and yeah. jujitsu helped you accomplish that goal. You love doing it. It's in my opinion, it's free exercise. Like it gets me at, like, I, I think every week I'm like, yeah, I just want to strength train because like, that's my biggest weakness. Yeah. You know, I think in jujitsu and, uh, I just don't do it cause I don't like it, you know? So it's free exercise for me. So it, it helps you accomplish that one goal of getting in shape or being more confident in a self-defense situation. You know, there's, a thousand different reasons you could start and you're going to accomplish that goal if you stick with it long enough. And then it's just going to be fun. And then it just, you know, at this point it's a game to me. Like I just want to get better at the game of jujitsu. No, I agree. I mean, like the, my main goal. So like my goal was always the same thing. Goals have changed. Originally I want to be this fucking hardcore, badass MMA fighter, clearly on the path of the UFC. <coughs> Cause you know, I already had this really sweet background, in Taekwondo, mm-hmm. and then you know, got my got woken up real quick to like that's not really gonna probably happen. And that's okay. Cause then it just changed to I just want to do jujitsu. And then I'm like, oh man, I need this for self defense, because you know, like if I can't keep some dude from just smashing my face in with a brick, then like what am I doing? And that's kind of been like the theme for the past, say, three or four years. Like competition's great and everything. And, <coughs> you know, there's nothing wrong with competing. I encourage competing or competition competing. Just like for me, the 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 pursuit of the art, like within a group of friends, as well as 
being able, like having that knowledge of like, yeah, I, could, I know I could defend myself and that it's like I have better chances by staying on top of it, making sure my guys are good. Like that's kind of what drives me now. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And so, so Rob, whenever you started this at Blue Belt, you got your purple belt, yeah. you know, shortly thereafter your, your podcast started. What, what did you feel like in your jujitsu? Take me from, take me from that blue to purple to brown. You recently, what's not been that recent? It was a uh, last October. Right last, yeah. 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 It was, it was shortly after camp, but take me, take me through that kind of part of the journey. What, because it intrigues me. Not that I, I care. Honestly, I, I don't, I don't really care to be promoted quite honestly that that's it's more responsibility it, i'm very happy where i'm yeah, at right oh, yeah, now as yeah, a two-stripe blue belt the most fun and least amount of pressure i ever had in jiu-jitsu was white belt right like, oh, honestly sure. yeah blue belt blue belt i think was actually my most stressful time in jiu-jitsu. was it really yes it was so um i got my blue belt i was really excited because i was like oh my god finally like you know i've been busted my ass for a while and yeah, I got blue belt, and then it just was like, okay, so now all the white belts are going to try to kill me. I can't let any white belts get me now, or else I don't deserve this blue belt. Right. And I was just, you know, running through white belts because I'm like, yeah, who's who's the man now, Mister Blue Belt? Right. Then we had another guy named Rob, and he was a he was a judo black belt, and he uh, he caught me with a choke, and I tapped, and I was like. Fuck, I got beat by a white belt as a blue belt. <laughs> That's that, a judo black belt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Well, it doesn't matter because judo and jiu-jitsu are completely... That, my my, my uh, stance on that has changed a lot, too. Of course. It's pretty much... It's copy... Nah, nah, nah. I'll leave that for another one. But um, I was like, That's it, man. I suck. I suck real bad. So um, kind of pushed through that. Uh, did a tournament... I uh, got first there, which was pretty cool. I was happy with that. Um, and then moved to Arizona and got just like uh, ran through in a tournament that I, I did there. And I think that was kind of like a wake up call for me. Not really, because the same shit happened in Germany as a purple belt, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But um, it was, um, I was like, maybe I need to work a little bit more on takedowns because that's really where I was getting, you know, just like tooled up on like I wrestled for a couple years in high school and I was not good at all I was I was I was there it was like participation trophy level sure, like yeah. yeah good job Rob you're still get here that you, on your permanent record yeah is what you, you know, want it. <laughs> it looked really good on college like uh, I wrestled for two years like how'd you do I was like well I wrestled for two years <laughs> <laughs> but uh but no so um went to purple belt and uh I did a lot of competition as a blue belt. Like I, I tried to compete as much as I possibly could in Arizona. Thankfully there's a lot of stuff to do in Arizona. Um, I didn't go the IBJJF route. I, I did the uh, SJJF um, competition or NABJJF type stuff out there. Um, then we got purple belt. I got purple belt. Uh, 20. Oh man. What year was that? Yeah. Yeah. It was like 2013. Uh, 20. No, no, no. It's 20, 2015. My bad. 2015 got promoted purple went to Germany. I was like, all right, cool, man. I'm a purple belt. Let's, uh, let's show these German guys all about jujitsu. Cause apparently like I was told there wasn't much. That's actually the exact opposite. There's quite a bit of jujitsu, good jujitsu in Germany. Sure. And I got beat by a blue belt in a tournament by, um, it was the, uh, it was EBI rules. Sure. And, um, so final, you were in overtime or we were no? in overtime. Yeah. Like I, no points, man. Cause I, I took them down. I was like, I had all my positions because that's what I'm used to, right? And I was like, all right, man, I should, this, I'm, I'm definitely winning this fight. I should be able to submit this dude. No, he was a judo guy too. But I'm like, I should have no problem submitting this guy. And I didn't submit him when it's overtime. Kind of understood the rules, kind of didn't. I thought like if I was attempting a submission from no matter what, that they would keep it like going and it wouldn't count as an escape. But my, I had a... Uh, I was starting a bow and arrow choke and started cinching it up and they called it cause he got out, but it's pretty down on myself for that. And then I was like, maybe I should just focus on teaching uh, cause I was teaching there and cause I, I found a lot of joy in that. So me teaching helped get my, I guess like skill set a little more solid 
and there wasn't as much like stress on it. You know, I couple I competed a couple times in Germany. I did like a tag team tournament. I did a oh cool. That was it was pretty fun. Did an MMA fight, and then that was really that was really it. And then got brown belt. And I'm like, what do I do? Where do I go from here? I really got to polish this up, like for for what's coming next, whenever it comes next. But like legitimately, it's never been. Well, blue belt. I I I do remember. I was kind of hunting for it, in a sense, because you know, nobody wants to be the white belt forever. Like that's just yeah. Everybody wants that validation. Yeah. Like yeah, you know, I'm a blue. I'm I'm with the cool guys now. Like look at me. I'm over here the cool guys. And then uh, you know, purple just showed up and brown kind of the same thing. I'm like, all right, cool. Like you know, I appreciate y'all kind of feeling that I'm worthy of it, but the mindset and just. It was not like quitting. There were plenty of times I wanted to, but it's just, you know, I almost joke about being like that project car. Put too much money into it. I can't just throw it away, man. I got to keep going. We're so, going to get that bad boy running one of these days. <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. It's going to be awesome. And then he's just like, the car never ran. And then he's just, eventually it will. He just sank so much money into it. Nah, but... I actually enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. And like, you know, like you guys are talking about, it's just different goals, man. It always changes. And I think that's what keeps it, uh, keeps it fresh. Yeah. Black belt may be the goal, but like the, the real goal is just coming here, seeing people training, meeting people, traveling, like all that stuff. Yeah. But is it the goal? Like black, like whenever, and, and I'll, I will say this on my, um, refrigerator, I have, you know, goals yeah. in my refrigerator Good. for me. And it was before it was actually, um, before I got my blue belt, my, my goal was to get a black belt. And I'm like, then I was like, that's a stupid goal because yeah, I just want to get better at jujitsu. Like, because guess what? Every black belt up there was going to tell you there's something that they got. We just got a lesson from James Klingerman. Yeah. He said, I just got a lesson from Dedeco. I mean, you, you, Trey Pace said it on the, on the podcast, and, and Ryan Hall is who told him this, who was his coach at the time. Yeah. He said, he said you're never as good and you're never as bad at jiu-jitsu as you think you are. And so I just want to get better. You know, that, that's it. And whether that means black belt, sure. I'm sure at some point in time, if I, if I can, you know, if my old ass doesn't get, uh, killed or hurt doing this, You'll be all right. debilitated, <laughs> right? Not train. I train pretty responsibly, but, but that, that I will be, but that's not the goal. No. It's not my goal anyway. Um, it's just to get better. Yeah, that's it. You don't want to make the what was it like goal have the ferrari like how do you get to there man like you know you yeah. gotta take it one step at a time like you know it's breaking up goals and all this other yeah yeah sure you might want to have timetables and whatever man it's it's a 10 to 12 year journey for for most people sure like unless you're you know you're hardcore just going yeah. at it every day eight days eight hours BJ Penn. yeah <laughs> actually my instructor he got a he recently just got promoted to, to a black belt and he did it in under six Wow. Yeah, but he's, I was like, okay, yeah, you know, he's a brown belt with like, you know, four years, five years. He's a, a monster because that's yeah. all he does. Yeah. Trains and trains and trains and trains and trains and traveled to train. And like, that's how I met him actually was because he was out in Europe doing a Jiu Jitsu, a, a BJJ Globe Carriers <laughs> camp. And I was like, yep, our visions line up. And I like to be your uh, student if you're down with it. And that's just kind of how it came to be. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Rob, we have done about 47 minutes. Oh, perfect. And uh, I really, Phil and I both really appreciate you being on here and co-streaming. And we appreciate being on the Big Jiu-Jitsu podcast. So Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. And folks out there, if you're not doing something to get better each and every day, get out there and do it. Rob, Bill, me, we all choose Jiu-Jitsu. We hope you do too.